Right. Welcome to this keynote. Um, so, my name is Aino Kori, and I'm from Denmark. Uh, so, this is a, a small Viking invasion that you're having right now in Berlin. I don't think we ever went that far before. Um, I want to talk about laughter and fun. Because, as I'll tell you through this story, which it is, laughter and fun has always been very important to me. And that's why I chose to take some pictures of myself laughing or having fun and put them on the front page here. So you see me with my, with my children and with my husband and some of my children, with my good friend that I really miss. How many misses him? Yeah, three. There were three that missed him. I won't draw any conclusions on that. Right. <clears throat> so why am I talking about laughter? Well, you probably, you've heard that the Danish people are the happiest people in the world, right? You've heard that. Now, the Finnish have overtaken us. We don't really know why. But I know why Danish people are so happy. Would you like to know it? Yeah, yeah. It's not because we have the higher taxes or no mountains or really bad weather. It's not that. Um, it's not because the men are not gentlemen and will never hold the door for you. It's not that either. It's simply because we have very low expectations. <laughs> Cheap trick of life. You can be happy. So if your expectations for happiness is watching a large Danish person speaking on stage, well, you're happy. <laughs> so let's get on with it. Why should you listen? I guess there are three reasons why you would listen. You want to be funny. You might be interested in why people laugh and what they laugh at and you want to hear the funniest joke in the world. But I guess that we might as well get it over with. While I have your attention, let's get the funniest joke in the world out of the way, and then you can sleep or play with your phones. I should also say there's a warning. I have some videos during my talk, but they're only two minutes each. So if you don't like watching them, you'll know that it's only two minutes, even though it might feel longer. So the scientifically proven funniest joke in the world. So, of course, he was British, a researcher, Richard Wiseman. He set out to find the funniest joke in the world. He looked at more than 40,000 jokes, and he got 1.5 million ratings, and he found the funniest joke in the world. And I'm going to show it, and then I'm going to read it aloud as well. So, two hunters are out in the woods when one of them collapses. He's not breathing, and his eyes are glazed over. So, his friend calls 999. My friend is dead. What should I do? The operator replies, calm down, sir, I can help. First, make sure that he's dead. There's silence, and then a loud bang. <laughs> so that is the funniest joke in the world. And what I'm going to do today is to dissect why that is funny. Why does it make you laugh? So back on the phone, the guy says, okay, now what? I forgot that, anyway. So. So we got that out of the, out of the way, and uh, let's, let's talk about why you laugh, what you laugh at, and how to be funny. So I want to tell this as a story of my life. So first I had a childhood, then I started presenting. As Diana said, I did that when I was very young. I must have been three years old in 1998. <coughs> and then I started facilitating. But you probably know the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. Uh, so he said, livet skal leves forlæns, men forstås baglæns. <laughs> because you might not understand Danish, I translated it to German for you. Das Leben muss vorwärts gelebt, aber rückwärts verstanden werden. And for those of you who still don't understand anything, <laughs> how many is that? Right, whoa! <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry about all the other German I have at the end of this. Oh. Uh, so it means that you have to live your life forward, but you have to understand it backwards. So you can't understand it while you're living it, but when you're reflecting, then you understand it. So that's why I've turned this story around. We're going to start with facilitating, then presenting, and then go back to my childhood in the end of the story. So facilitating. I think that humor is very important in my job as a facilitator. Because, for instance, this is a picture of a huge facilitation. It was three days, uh, 140 software systems, 110 people, um, and they should all take responsibility for these systems, and they should be put in teams, and, and we needed something to get through these three days. So I think icebreakers to make things people laugh in the beginning, and jokes along the way, is very important. And also, as I said in the abstract, right now we, we use agile development methods for software development, and we have to inspect and adapt. 
And when you're inspecting how things are going, you need a sense of humor to actually <laughs> accept that. And I do a lot of retrospectives as well, and I think that humor is very important in retrospectives. So I, when, when things get really sad or when they get painful, I try to use humor to diffuse that stress situation. So sometimes I make fun at other companies, sometimes I make fun at software systems, sometimes I make fun at computer languages. I mean, um, first we made fun of C, then we made fun of Java, now we make fun of C++. It's, it's sort of changing all the time, so we have to figure out who is the hated one right now. So it used to be that we could make fun of Microsoft, but not at Google, but now I think it's the opposite, like we love Microsoft and we hate Google. So you need to figure out who you can make fun of, but you can always make fun of yourself, which is something I do a lot. It's very easy for me. So what actually happens when you laugh? Well, you have this frontal lobe here, and that's the part of the brain that takes in everything that you see and you hear and you feel, and then it decides whether it's funny or not. And if the frontal lobe makes the decision that this is funny, it sends out signals to the cerebral cortex. And these signals then makes the rest of the brain do things to our body. And it's these things that it's doing to our body that I find very interesting when it comes to fun and laughter. So of course it makes us sort of shake, it makes us laugh. So that is sort of um, the muscle workout and sometimes you have the feeling that you can almost die of laughter. And if you look at what's happening with an X-ray, when people are laughing, you can see that it looks like actually the body is trying to kill you because you're blowing the air out of the lungs, but you're not actually capable of sucking in air while you're laughing. So it could kill you, but it's also a nice muscle workout. Uh, it decreases stress and anxiety. And why does it de decrease stress and anxiety? Well, Karl Marcy from Harvard Business School, oh, medical school, of course, um, has used laughter therapy. And he shows that, at least on middle-aged women, it works as an antidepressant. And I don't care about the rest of people. And, and what, <laughs> what laughter does is that it raises the serotonin levels. And serotonin, as you know, is a crucial neurotransmitter for feelings of well-being and calmness. So it also improves the, mo the mood and resilience. So you probably know that there are four different um, hormones for, for feeling good. So one of them is serotonin, as I talked about. The next one is endorphin. And endorphin, you can get that if you feel pain, if you endure physical exercise, but also if you drink wine and you laugh. Uh, I prefer the last. Dopamine, you get that as a reward if you've done something that you feel good about. And then, of course, there's oxytocin, but you can only get that from actually touching people, so that's not part of the laughter here. So the f psychological important of, importance of laughter is also um, interesting because, as, as mentioned before, it actually makes you more resilient to things that are bad. So there are some people who've looked at what you need in order to have jobs in like your firefighters or you're, you're a nurse in an emergency ward. And people who have a good sense of humor actually last better in these jobs. They don't, they don't go down with stress, they can work for longer, because if you have a good sense of humor, then you're more resilient and, and you can feel good about yourself. And also if you're, if you're building object-oriented programming languages, then it's uh, important to to, ah, oh man, that was, I rehearsed this at home. There he is. You know who that is, because he was just up there, Bjarne Strohstrup, and he's actually from my university in Denmark, so. Hmm? Yep, yeah. oh. And then, what about presentations? Is it important to be funny when you're presenting? Well, not necessarily. You can work with other things as well. But let's talk about how you can be funny when you're presenting. So, one way of being funny when you're presenting is to use self-deprecating humor in the beginning. So, for instance, today when I said that Diana dated me, I made a joke about how old I was. So that's self-deprecating humor. And that's fine. Um, if, if you feel like you dare to do that, if you feel that you have sort of... Uh, if you already feel that you have the respect from people, then you can do that. And respect is part of the things that you need to give a talk. So, to give a talk, you need, you need three things. You need logos, pathos, and ethos. And uh, those are like the um, Aristotle's modes of persuasion. 
And, and Logos is what you're saying, that you know what you're talking about, and Pathos is, uh, is that you're excited about it, that you're enthusiastic, that you're really interested in this subject yourself, and people can tell that. And then you have Ethos, which is the interesting thing, is the respect that you have from people. So because I'm a keynote speaker, I already have some respect even though you don't know me, because they, you probably think somebody must have thought something about it since they put me here. So I already have some ethos, even though I don't have a book or anything like that. Um, but you can also build ethos while you're talking. So, as I said before, with self-deprecating humor, don't use a lot of that if you don't have any ethos yet. So use it with care. But if you can, then it's interesting. So uh, George Bush, you remember George Bush, right? <laughs> that was when we thought they had a stupid... And, uh, anyway. <clears throat> Cut that up the video, please. <laughs> so George Bush said in a commencement address at Southern Methodist University, um, those of you graduating with high honors and distinctions, I say, well done. And as I like to tell the C students, you too can be president. <laughs> so that's also self-deprecation, but he can do it because he had a lot of ethos because he was the president, right? So he could get away with anything. Um, we love to show that we understand, which you can make use of if you, if you make jokes. So, People will laugh because they don't want to seem stupid. So if you want people to laugh, for instance, at a stage or in a meeting, you make a joke about something technical, or you make a joke about something in the news or history or something like that, so that people will laugh to show, ah, I got that, I got that reference, I understood that. You say 42 and the people will laugh because I read that book. I don't want to pretend I didn't. Um, so sometimes I say it if I introduce speakers at conferences, for instance, I said, when I introduced Steve Minoski years ago, uh, a lot of people know him as the father of Stoa, Soa, but he's actually just the nice uncle of Soa, the one that brought the mother chocolates, um, because he, he doesn't want to say that he's the father of Soa. And then only the people who understand that laughs. But the interesting thing is, if some people who, have, who are high in the hierarchy is laughing at that joke, other people will laugh as well, because they want to be as smart as that, as that person. Another thing I could say is, yes, he helped develop XML, but he was young and needed the money. <laughs> so that's a double joke, because uh, a sexual reference, uh, which is almost always funny, especially since I'm not saying that's got any, well, I do now, but you know, when I did that, I didn't, right? So you have to think it. And then I also um, I, I put down XML, because that's when we, that was when we learned that XML was uh, not, not as brilliant as we thought it would be. And the last thing, uh, it can grow costly and time consuming to constantly rebuild and redeploy client applications, especially through app stores, and you know which app store we talk about. Again, you love to show, okay, I, I put an app in, in, uh, in, in the Apple store, so I know how difficult it is. We also love to show that we belong, so it's a way of saying, I belong to this group, so I laugh. And I facilitate a lot of different meetings with uh, developers, and to me, it's a very bad sign if they don't laugh together. So if they don't laugh together, they don't want to show that they belong together. So it's a sign in that way, but it's also a sign, perhaps, that they don't trust each other enough to relax enough to laugh. Um, if they laugh at each other, of course, it's even worse. So jokes about uh, that we belong. So when I studied mathematics in the 90s, um, some people made a survey about the jokes and the humor we made, and they found out that the humor we had in mathematics was about people who didn't understand maths. And why did we do that? Well, we did, we, we did it because a lot of us had been outsiders at school, because we were geeks and we liked mathematics and we were weird, we didn't think about fashion or anything like that. And, uh, and now suddenly we were together with people and we wanted to show that we were together. And a way of showing togetherness is to laugh at other people. Uh, jokes about C++ programming, as I said, it's always funny. Jokes about a common enemy, so I'll come back to that in some of the German jokes. Jokes about nationalities and yourself. No, not like that, no! No, not gonna laugh at German people here, that would be really stupid. Would I? <laughs> I'll do it when you're not listening. Uh, so I, so I, I, set out, I set out to find some German jokes 
I know it sounds ridiculous to try that, but I did. And, uh, and you actually, you do that as well, you laugh at other people. Let me point the finger back at you. Which nationality was Ötzi the Iceman? Right, this is a German joke. He wasn't Italian as he carried tools. <laughs> See? Yeah. I don't find that funny at all. He wasn't Austrian since he had brains. No. Who here is Austrian? You're laughing. Very good. Irony is good. Self-irony even better. He might have been Swiss since he was overtaken by a glacier. But most probably he was North German because nobody else walks in sandals in the mountains. Right. So, where did it all start? Ina was a child in Denmark and she was weird. You can see she's hanging upside down here. Um, so I was always an outsider. People were making fun of me. I wouldn't say bullying, but they were ridiculing me all the time. I think I was living in my own head and I took everything too concretely. I didn't understand like when people made fun of things. So I, I, I had a, it was stressful. So the way I, I learned to cope with it was to make fun of myself. So that's when it all started. It's a bit sad, but now I like it. And uh, I can always make fun of myself. And in all situations, making fun of yourself can feel really nice, especially for the other people. And uh, what happened when I made fun of myself was that they might still laugh at me, but at least they laughed with me, at me. So that's how it started with me and fun. So some things that are bad can be good later. Because laughter can also push people apart. So in, in bullying, there's a lot of laughter, right? As I said before, laughing at a common enemy. Laughing to show that you belong also means laughing to show that other people don't belong. So it could be very negative. And also, men exposed to sexist humor, they say, are more likely to endorse sexist beliefs, withhold donations from women's organizations, and have higher endorsements of rape myths. Which means that when people say, oh, I'm only joking, no, it's just for fun. It's never only joking. It's never just for fun. That thought came from somewhere in your head, right? So it's never just funny, right? That was the only serious part of this. I'll stop yelling at you now. Because it can also pull people together. It can work as a locksmith in both platonic and romantic social interactions. It helps us break the ice, gain social acceptance, initiate romantic overtures. We perceive funny people as smarter, more attractive, and more personable because being funny is one of these, they call them mental fitness indicators. So it's, it can be hard to say, to figure out who is intelligent and who is not just by looking at the genetic mutations. But the less you have, the more intelligent you sometimes are. And humor and creativity are mental fitness indicators that you are intelligent and that you have good genes and you have less mutated Greek genes. So for those of you who are not funny, I can tell you you also have really bad genes. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so human relationships. Both men and women um, seem to prefer someone with a good sense of humor. So this research uh, was done when we only looked at men and women. And I'm sorry, I haven't seen anything updated on non-binary, but bear with me here. So both men and women seem to prefer somebody with a good sense of humor for a relationship. But when they say good sense of humor, it's not, it's not like, it's not exactly the same. Because men highlighted the importance of their partner's receptivity to their own humor, whereas women valued humor production and receptivity equally. Which means that women in general like men who are funny and that makes them laugh, and that laughs at their jokes, but men prefer women, not that are funny, but that laugh at their jokes. <laughs> and you can also, you can actually say that it's sexual selection that has made, made some men funny. And perhaps that's why there are so many men that are stand-up comedians, because it's, I mean, it gives you, it, well, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, they've also looked at uh, laughter and dating, and they've uh, tried to figure out so can we count the amount of minutes that a woman laugh at the first date and the amount of minutes that a man laugh at the first date? And the amount of laughter from the woman is very correlated with whether there is a second date or not. How much the man laughs doesn't really matter. But if the woman laughs a lot at the man, 
there's a higher chance of a second date. We don't know whether it's a correlation or a causality. We don't know whether it's because he's funnier and she wants to see him again, or whether he likes her because she's laughing. But it's interesting to see that this correlation is so strong. Now, there are two types of laughter. The natural laughter that comes from being mentally tickled or surprised. I'll get back to that. And then the post-laughter, the social laughter that you do to show that you belong. Unfortunately, you have to be almost grown up to be able to tell the difference. So how many of you are younger than 28? Right, so you can't tell the difference. <laughs> you can't tell the difference between post-laughter or natural laughter. So on your first date, you might be terribly, terribly tricked that she's just laughing at you to be nice. And it's also the same for smiles. There's different areas in the brain that lights up when you're smiling for real or when you have a fake smile or a social smile. So the real smiles are from Brodmann's area 4 and the fake smiles are from Brodmann's area 24. And if you look at old movies, you could see that when they smiled in old movies, it was just a smile. Um, and you can actually tell when you look at it that they're not really smiling, it's just a fake smile. And then method acting came in and now people are thinking about things that makes them happy, and then they smile naturally. Uh, but again, it's only if, uh, if you're in your late 20s that you can actually tell the difference. So I put in a slide to help you. This is a fake smile. <laughs> now you know. Now, look at this. Don't say anything. Look at it till the end. Right, how do you feel? Sad. Some of you not sad, trying to find the psychopaths in the room. <laughs> Sorry. It might not, I mean, it could just be a bad day. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that you already know that we mimic each other's body language, right? If, if, if people are having their feet like this and you like them, you bend your feet like this, and. If they do like this, you sort of mimic this a little bit to show that you like them. You're not even thinking about that. Another thing that you're not thinking about is that you're also mimicking their facial expressions. And that's an important part of, of having empathy for somebody. So it's not just listening to what they're saying, they're telling a story about how sad they are, but actually when the face looks like this, your face looks like this, and your muscles send signals to your brain um, to tell you that you're now sad. It's the same thing that happens if you're sad, you can smile. And if you smile for a long time, well, the muscles sort of pulling your nerves will make you think that you're happier and you will be happier. The interesting thing is that some research has been done with people who are using Botox because it's, um, it's well known that if you're using Botox, people can't tell what you feel. But the interesting thing is also that if you are using Botox, then you have a a worse chance of actually having empathy with people. So you can tell that people who have Botox injections have less empathy. Uh, research shows that and because they can't move their facial muscles. That's the point of Botox. And then I think some of you will, might be thinking perhaps they're just cold people to start with, the people who are using Botox. Perhaps they're just uh, like superficial. They're only thinking about how people look. So they made different kinds of research. They've taken people who also uh, like to use Botox, but they gave them a filler instead to, to make them sort of fill the wrinkles instead of um, doing the Botox thing. And, and if, so this is the same kind of people that choose Botox. And the interesting thing that happens if you put in a filler, it, it means that the face is um, resisting resisting your muscles even more. And it's that muscle resisting that sends the signals to the brain about how you feel. So the people who used the filler actually had more empathy than they had before because there was more resistance in the muscles. There's also, they've also tried to put some cream on the muscles in the face to, to stop them from moving, to mimic the, the effect of Botox, and that also gave a lower um, empathy. So it's interesting how important it is for us to be able to 
put our face sort of in the right way to, to believe in and, and really feel what other people are feeling. Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner, you probably heard about him. Uh, he talked about something called kick of the discovery. And this kick of the discovery actually explains exactly what it feels like to me when somebody says something funny that makes me laugh. So the theory is that whenever somebody starts a sentence, you build sort of a tree in your brain with all the different possible outputs of sentences that could come from that one word. And then when you get another word, well, you close down part of the tree, well, it couldn't be that sentence then, I'm guessing these different sentences instead. You get another word, so you cut off more, you get another word, you get another word, you get another word, and then only two possibilities for what they can say at the end, that'll be this then, okay. So that's how most people communicate. Uh, it's pretty obvious what they're going to say. At least once I've said the first three or four words in a sentence, you want to sort of, I can finish that sentence for you, because I'm, I'm smarter and faster. But what Richard Feynman meant when he said kick of the discovery is that sometimes, instead of saying what you expect, people will say something different. And then you have to change that whole tree in your brain. And I always thought of it as sort of being tickled in the brain, because it almost physically feels like that to me. When somebody's saying something, different, something I hadn't expected, and it's like, <laughs> it's like being tickled, but inside the brain. So that's kick of the discovery. And, and one example of the kick of the discovery joke is uh, a, a woman told her friend, my husband and I were the happiest people for 18 years, and then we met. <laughs> so that's an example of uh, kick of the discovery. And uh, here's another example of um, kick of the discovery, it's a Google search, and, uh, well, it's, it's my Google search. <clears throat> and at some point, you will know about when this Google search was made. So when you say how, Google tries to, mm, probably one of these things. How can, oh, probably these things. Well, well, probably one of these things. How can I learn English? How can I improve my, how can I learn Danish language? Well, not just my search then, because I'm pretty good at Danish already. How can I kill, blah, 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 blah. How can I kill the, hmm. <laughs> Interesting. So, so trying this out, you'll sort of know what people are Googling right now. Like they Googled after the Brexit vote in England, what, what does EU mean? Things like that, it's, it's kind of unnerving. So I like different kinds of jokes. I like, I love Blackadder, Seinfeld, XKCD, Dilbert. I like anti-jokes. I like sarcasm, irony, and satire. And, uh, oh, don't tell the one about the Finnish roulette. <laughs> so, an anti-joke. I learned it when I was work, I, I worked in, uh, in Sweden. And in Sweden, they make fun about Finnish people, okay? How many Finnish people are here today? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to tell it anyway, I've got a silver medal in judo. <laughs> so, uh, so you know Russian roulette, right? It's the thing about the gun. And... So Finnish roulette. It's two Finnish people go into a sauna, each carrying a bottle of uh, vodka. <laughs> and uh, one of them goes out. No, no, they drink the bottle of vodka. Each drink a bottle of vodka in the sauna. And one of them goes out, and then the other has to guess who left. So that's Finnish roulette. You can ask the Finnish people if that's true. So I like Blackadder. Here are some of my favorite jokes. Am I jumping the gun, Baldrick? Or are the words? I have a cunning plan, marching with ill-deserved confidence in the direction of this conversation. And worst idea since someone said, yeah, let's take this surprise, suspiciously large wooden horse into a Troy. Statue is all the rage this season. Of course, there's something you only laugh if you know about Troy and the horse, so you're showing that you understand. It might not even be funny, but you want to seem clever. Baldrick, does it have to be this way? Our valued friendship ending with me cutting you up into strips and telling the prince that you walked over a very sharp category in an extremely heavy head. I like that because it sort of kicked the discovery. It's, I definitely didn't expect him to say something like that. Blackadder versus Mr. Bean is interesting for Rowan Atkinson because Rowan Atkinson uses a lot of words. He's very eloquent. He, he, can, he can say things that are funny without, I think, even 
meaning to. But then he invented Mr. Bean to see if he could be funny without words. So it was a challenge he made for himself. And some people think that it worked out. Um, I'm more on the black atlas. Right, so where are we? You heard the funniest joke. Uh, you know why people laugh and what they laugh at. So you, the only thing I have left is uh, in the last four minutes to teach you how to be funny. Easy peasy. So humor requires mastery of sophisticated functions like self-awareness, empathy, spontaneity, and linguistic subtlety. Hmm? Oh, you can be funny. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not done. Sorry. Also crucial for getting a partner. <laughs> and uh, do good talks, and, well, everything, really. Uh, no pressure. Uh, timing is everything. As I said before, some jokes are only funny the first time. Most of my jokes are only funny the first time because they surprise myself as much as they surprise other people. Some people use slides to make sure the timing is right, and today I did that. I put some funny things in my slides, and I made sure that there was funny things for everybody, like people who like to laugh at other people's problems, slides for that people who like to laugh to show that they're intelligent, slides for that, and things like that. So I try to sort of serve everybody. Um, so just to sum up, to be funny, you can, you can surprise, say something that people didn't expect, show a slide that people didn't expect. Um, one of the best things I ever saw was, we had a speaker from Microsoft, that was when, <clears throat> that was when everybody hated Microsoft, and uh, so he was on stage and everybody was like, mm. Microsoft probably bought this keynote. Program. And then the first slide he showed um, was a meme with somebody just throwing money out. And he said, I want to tell you why I'm working at Microsoft. And, I says, <laughs> and when I feel sad, I just think about that. Not because I want to work at Microsoft, but I think it was just, it was so good. It was so well timed, and it was the right point in time for that joke. So if you make jokes that can enable people to show, to feel that they belong if they laugh, then um, they, they, they will probably laugh because they have to. It's a social laughter, it doesn't matter. It can become a, a, a real laughter in time. The same, same thing about being clever. If you, if you tell a joke or you say something that people sort of need to understand to laugh at, then they feel the need to laugh to show that they understand, to show that, that they're, they're clever. Uh, you can use common animosity, laugh at somebody else, like Microsoft or now Google. Uh, or you can use artificial intelligence. Let's see how that's going now. So artificial intelligence and the humor, are they going to take over the world? That's a question we're all asking. Let's look at their best jokes. What do you call a cat does it take to screw in a light bulb? They could worry the banana. No, no. let's try another one. Why did the cowboy buy a frog? Because he didn't have any brains. Yeah, not, not really, right? What do you get when you cross a frog with a street? A main toad. So AI and humor, not really there yet, right? Um, what do you get when you cross an optic with a mental object? An idea that's marginally funny. <laughs> but what about Germans? Um, wird ein Vampir von der Polizei angehalten? Hören Sie mal, Sie haben doch getrunken. Sagt der Vampir, ach, nur zwei Radler. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, really, it's really untranslatable to English. <laughs> So if you don't understand it, you just have to find somebody who understood it in the break and ask them to explain it to you. Here's another one. Was macht ein Clown im Büro? Faxen. <laughs> it's, it is funny. Uh, yep. We're there. Whoops. I was supposed to just pretend it was the last slide. And thank you for your time. <laughs>